Finally tonight, writing the story of Africa, Jeffrey Brown talks with Chinua Achebe 50 years after the publication of his novel, Things Fall Apart. For a long time, the story of Africa was told almost exclusively through the words of European writers. That began to change in the 1950s as African countries achieved independence and African writers began to tell their own stories. One book in particular, Things Fall Apart, published in 1958, has become a classic of world literature, translated into some 50 languages, selling 11 million copies. It was set in a village in what is now Nigeria, just as the Igbo people there had their first encounters with European Christian missionaries. Chinua Achebe was just 28 when he wrote the book, his first novel. He's since written numerous other works of fiction, mostly set in post-colonial Africa, as well as non-fiction and poetry. And last year was named winner of the prestigious Man Booker International Prize for Fiction. So, we are here at the African Studies Center at University of Oxford. I'll be speaking to Professor Mines Lama, the Director of African Studies Center, about Mr. James Corey and what he means to the African Studies Center. Join me as I introduce you to Professor Mines. I'm Miles Lama, I'm Professor of African History at the University of Oxford uh, and I'm also Director of the African Studies Centre. I think I've known three different versions of James. Uh, I grew up on, like many of us, reading African Writers series and I knew James was involved in it, although I didn't at that time have a great appreciation of the really important role he played. But in many ways, I was a student of, of the work that James curated in his work with the African Writers Series. Then at a later point, he was someone I got to know in Oxford. He was this amazing elder figure who was a key uh, individual around the African Studies Center who would come to events. And I didn't, because of his humility, necessarily know who he was or his significance. He was someone who came to events and would talk informally. And then you realize, oh, this is James Curry, this person who has done this amazing work over time. I'm really proud to say that now, uh, it, just in the last year, I'm also an author who is published with the James Curry um, publication series uh, that is now published by Boydell and Brewer. So I have the honor of being associated with James Curry's name as an author, uh, humbly following in the long footsteps of the much more renowned authors and writers who've published with and worked with James uh, over many decades. Well, James Curry is a big name in African studies. I doubt if there's anybody in African studies, especially people of my generation, that don't know James Curry. He's, um, recently he, he's been an academic book publisher, but before then I had met him even as a student of literature uh, because he was uh, connected with the African Writer Series. Um, and that time I got to know him. I hadn't met him in person, but I knew him by reputation and also because of the work he did for African write, for the African Writer Series. So for me, he is a man I have respected all my life, uh, at least since I became a, a student of the, of, uh, in the university system. And um, he, he is one of the people that lifted up African writers, especially writers of the first and second generation. Without people like him, those writers might not have been known globally. So James Corey is a man, a global figure in African studies, and he's the kind of personality whose legacy will remain permanently in African studies. <laughs> So I'm at the Parsonage Grill in Oxford to meet the inaugural James Curry Fellow, 
Stephen Abington. Uh, he's a British South African author. I'll be speaking to him. Hello, my people. Bro, eh? No. <laughs> Mr. Steven. How are you? That's my title. <laughs> Thank you. Who is James Curry to you? Uh, to me personally, uh, he is somebody that has uh, brought a vast body of uh, African literature to the world, but most importantly to Africans, first and foremost. And to me, that's something that is rich in the stories that have been uh, published through Heinemann. Uh, and with uh, James spearheading uh, that initiative for uh, a good many decades, uh, it produced uh, probably the most prolific amount of, of African literature under uh, one group. And so for, for me, and in, in a relationship with him being here in Oxford, I'm able to uh, get his experience of right. that and interact with them and get advice most importantly because you know the things that we're trying to do here as part of the James Curry Society is uh, getting more African literature out to the world and continuing his his legacy. James Curry is someone I discovered when uh, there's this young man known as Onyaka well a oh, prof and every time he was telling me about James Curry James Curry and I was like Who's that? okay Onyaka started another thing and then I took time and discovered that he was somebody that was very interested in African writers and went on to work with major publishers and set up the African Writers Series. And so some of the books I'd read along the way, he had helped to publish and push. And um, so I got to know another character that is in the, in the history that helped the back of African cinema, uh, African f books. And for me, it's always good to give people their roses when they're alive. So it's nice to know who he is and what he, that he was the one behind. I think it's about 295 books or 300 and something. I think, yeah, it's between 200, 300, 295 or 323 books that are published under the African Writers Series. Yeah. James Curry is a visionary who loved Africa and Africans and wanted to promote the culture written of Africa and from Africans as well. He's a man that chose not to sit back and watch things happen however, but he decided to take things up and ensure that whatever the reason, whatever the cause, these voices must be heard. James Curry, um, what can you say about a man that um, has dedicated his adulthood you know, a very important part of his life to, to Africa? I mean, in 1962, after studying at history at the University of Oxford, James Curry left to South Africa to do his apprenticeship and spent two years there. After two, after two years, he returned in 1964. 1964. He then started working with Gino Achebe when they started the African Writer Series at Henneman. Okay, they continued publishing up until um, later in the early 80s when, um, when there was a, the economic downturn. Then, you know, publishers decided that publishing African books were not lucrative anymore. When the new um, owners of Heinemann decided that they were going to stop publishing African books. James Curry decided it was time to leave. He left and started his own publishing house. That just, I'm just saying all this. I'm just giving all this backstory to show you how much dedication, how much love James had for Africa and how he has dedicated his life to, to showing it. I feel like calling James Curry the godfather of African literature is the best title you can give to him because he is. 
he has dedicated his life to proving that he is truly an African in blood. <laughs> My name is Onye Kawenluwe. I am a native of Ezokensu in the Himembano local government area of Imo State in eastern Nigeria. I'm the fourth child of Honorable Sam Welue of Ezokensu and Lady Catherine Welue of Uguta. I was born in January 1988. I hail from a lineage that on both paternal and maternal branches, steeped in the knowledge and traditions of the Igbo people. A lineage of creoles that is prodigiously talented in the enterprise of storytelling. A lineage that is characterized by academic and professional distinction in various spheres and members of whom have consistently ventured into and distinguish themselves in public service. My story extends a legacy about which my family is rightfully proud. Have written and published over 15 books, have also produced films. One about my dear aunt Flora Wapa, who was the first woman to be published on the African Writers Series, co founded by James Curry and Chino Achebe. And this is where my story with James Curry begins. If you love the moody man. I'm on my way to Thames Street in Oxford to speak to Mr. James Curry. Thames Street is where he lives. And I would like to talk to him about African Writers Series and his creation by Alan Hill and Chino Achebe. African Writers Series is a series that introduced African authors to Africa and the rest of the world. And it's interesting that Mr. James Curry co-founded this uh, series and he has some insights that I would like to know. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Oh <laughs> this is for you. This is for you for everything you've been doing for oh. us. Yeah. So you can hold it. This is for Oh my goodness. James Matt. So this will have we'll have to have it. Oh, oh. Yeah, okay. Next week, uh, um, I, I come and go a bit. Uh, uh, um, Joanna lives down in Bath, and okay. but uh, do, do we want to fix a date now, or, or will you when you come back? Yeah, I think I think it's better when I come back. Okay. Yes, yeah. I can easily come. Spend yeah. Time and yeah. Time. This is Africa Rise Back. James Curry, the African Writer Series and the launch of African Literature. I read randomly. There was a big problem. Paperbacks are mostly reprint series. But what to reprint when so few novels by Africans had been published in hardback by British American publishers in that very year of the start of the series, 1962. There was a conference on African writing at Makrari College in Uganda in July. Chino Achebe had a knock at the door of his guest house in the evening and found a student standing there who offered him the manuscripts of two novels. The name of the Kenyan student was Nguji. Alan Hill tells what happened next. It must be remembered that at the time, telephoning from Africa was difficult and expensive and also Van Mill would have had to be very insistent to have managed to get Alan Hill out of a board meeting. Alan Hill had put Keith Sambrook in charge of the rapid expansion of offices in what we were then starting to call the Third Ward. Early in 1964, 
During a visit to Nigeria, they gave a party at Hotel Bristol in Lagos to celebrate the publication of Chinua Achebe's third novel, Hour of God. The major reasons for being in Nigeria were to interview candidates and appoint a successor to Chief Fagunwa, the more famous Yoruba author who was the first manager of Heinemann Educational Books in Nigeria, and appoint a successor to Chief Fagunwa, the famous Yoruba author who was the first manager of Heinemann Educational Books in Nigeria. He had tragically been drowned in October 1963 on a Niger ferry crossing when traveling back to Ibadan after a visit to the north with Keith Sandbrook. Surveying the literary scene in contemporary Africa. Today we feature an interview with the Nigerian novelist Chinua Achebe. Mr. Achebe is author of the novels Things Fall Apart and No Longer at Ease. His third novel, Arrow of God, is soon to be published. The African Writer Series has always been uh, incredibly important for me, even when I first started as a historian and social scientist. Um, for leisure and to inform all the writing I was doing, the African Writers Series was the go-to place to learn about how Africans had written about their own history and their own writing. Um, I would associate the sort of decline of the African Writers Series in some ways with the loss that um, Africa suffered in its most difficult post-independence period, I would say economically uh, and developmentally in the late 1980s, 1990s and early 21st century. So for me, I think the revival of the African Writers Series carries with it both the possibility of um, that Africa is uh, more today in the driving seat of its own future than it has been since the early promise of independence with which the original African Writers Series was associated. The African Writers Series, it, it formed a very, very, very important part of my, my literary life while growing up. And imagine that these books were not there. Imagine that um, all these books were not available for us to be able to read and have access to in the capacity that we did while growing up. Because these things, they formed, they formed um, prior to that, we only had the, the foreign books, the Romeo and Juliet, the Shakespearean books that was read in England. But because of the works of James Corey and because of the African Writers Series, that was the first African Writers Series that, was, that consists of the Chino Achebe, the Ngugu Antiongo, and the and all of that, we were able to read that. It created the, the idea, the, the, the image of Africa that we know, we were able to relate with our own stories. It doesn't get better than that. So when, when that was stopped, the resurrection of African um, writer series that we are trying to do now, we're trying to bring that back. We're trying to celebrate Africa. We're trying to um, tell our own stories. We're trying to, it forms part of our identity. So it, what is ours, we need to be able to tell our own stories in the way that we understand it, in the way that we know, than allowing people to just come in and, and then um, try to create a story for us or try to stereotype us or put us in a type of box. So, so the African Writers Series is, is really important. It's really, it's resurrection, is, it is timely and it should always continue. It's something that should always, it should never be stopped. After my novel, Things Fall Apart, was published. It just looked as if people had been waiting everywhere, uh, in, in Africa, in Nigeria, in Igbo land, to tell the, their own version of, of their story, as if um, something was holding them uh, before. And, uh, and it seems to me that that's a, a very good thing indeed. Typically, uh, as a Nigerian, and uh, most Africans would have encountered James Corey since uh, with the beginning of uh, the African Writers Series. Because, I mean, that's when we, some of us didn't even know where it came from, but we just knew there was this African series, there was a writer's series that was everywhere. So um, I guess 
that would be my very first encounter with him. And it was, it was exciting because that was uh, the moment where the promotion was not just about Africans or Africans and diaspora, but also for non-Africans. So if you grew up before the millennium, before the Y2K in 2000, and you went to school in some African countries, especially my own country, Nigeria, there is no way you wouldn't have come across a copy of one book written by one of the many authors that were published by James Curry's uh, African Writers series. Where my story connects with James Curry is where Flora Mapa enters the center stage in 1966, which was when a woman entered the African literary canon with her debut novel, Efru, which was published as number 26 in the canonical Heinemann African Writer Series. I started that book in my, in my house. Okay. That's how it started. Agnes said she was driving from Lagos and once she dropped. That's right. She was driving, my, my sister was driving from Queen School where she was teaching. She graduated from Ibadan too. Yes. <laughs> So she was driving to see me on a visit. I've forgotten the reason why she came on that particular trip. So as soon as uh, she landed in my house, she started the book. That's how we, that's how Efuru started. Hmm. And that was in 1959. Her second novel, Idu, was published as number 56 in the series in 1970. But she remained the only Nigerian woman writer in the series for almost a decade until the publication of Puchi and Mecheta's The Joys of Motherhood in 1979. Of books in 1967 and I first went out to Nigeria in 1968 and um, uh, she was living in the east then I think wasn't she Enugu? Um and uh, uh, I didn't travel down to the east that time, so uh, I, 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 do, uh, 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 I think I must have met her at, with Aigigo in Ibadan, in, the, uh, in Jericho in Ibadan. Uh, but, um, no, it, it, like many people, you, you, the, 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 you can't quite remember when you didn't know them. <laughs> okay, but was there anything special about her? Um, well, I, I mean, I think she was a, a, a very, uh, my memory was that she was uh, uh, very much, uh, uh, her mind was made up and she was pretty firm and uh, knew, what she, uh, knew what she wanted. Flora Mapa was also the first female publisher in Africa. She set up her own publishing company, Tana Press, in 1977, not least to facilitate the local production of women's and children's literature. Well, of course, I, I will always think of uh, Chinua Achebe when I am asked this kind of question because Achebe, things fall apart and um, no longer at his and one of the people. These were books that resonated with me and I love them. But I must also say, as a woman writer myself, that for a long time, for almost two decades, nothing was published by a woman writer in the series. So you can imagine my joy when in 1966, um, I was uh, in, the, in the university at that time. No, I was uh, in the secondary school. And then Flora Mwapa's Ifuru was published. One thing is interesting that in her novel Ifuru again, uh, you know, the heroine of Ifuru, um, didn't didn't really marry in that way. She she eloped with her husband, first husband, and the second one was also somebody that uh, she chose without much consideration of, uh, of her family. Um, why did she marry Gogun Wadakuchi? I don't know. I don't think it was arranged. Um, it was her personal choice, and Flora Nwapa certainly was somebody who was very uh, strong in her views on, on women, <clears throat> on women's rights. What uh, writers on that African Writers Series spoke to you? Well, uh, definitely Bessie Head, uh, Maru, 
um, Wale Shoinka in particular, uh, the interpreters, um, then Sal Plaki, uh, Nadine Gordema, um, yeah, I mean, the, uh, and uh, Florence and Wiper, uh, you know, those are, those are very iconic individuals um, with uh, some beautiful uh, writing, uh, pertinent stories for their time and, you know, beyond. So, you know, those, those I think, are the, the authors and the, 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 the books, the works that I'll be always rereading. Well, the book that made the most impact on me as a young man, and this tells you everything about me as someone in my late teens, was uh, Usman Semben's God's Bits of Wood, which was obviously published in French and then crucially published in English by the African Writers Series. It's obviously a book about, you know, the, the post-war uh, train strike in French West Africa. Um, what was important for me then was this idea that here was a story of ordinary Africans fighting back against colonial injustice, against economic exploitation. But as someone who was studying those things from a sort of historical point of view, he was a historical story um, invested with real rounded characters, with drama, uh, where the characters weren't uh, necessarily good guys or bad guys in a straightforward way. Uh, the characters were invested with human emotion and agency and complexity. And I loved Semben's ability to tell stories uh, that uh, invested um, historical or political questions with uh, a, a sense of uh, a sense of majesty in many respects, a sense of drama and narrative. The African Writers Series it, it formed a very, very, very important part of my my literary life while growing up. And imagine that these books were not there. Imagine that. Um, all these books were not available for us to be able to read and have access to in the capacity that we did while growing up. Because these things, they formed, they formed um, prior to that, we only had the, the foreign books, the Romeo and Juliet, the Shakespearean books that was read in England. But because of the works of James Corey and because of the African Writers Series, that was the first African Writers Series that's, that consists of the Chino Achebe, the Ngugu Antiongo, and the Flora Mwakwa and all of that, we were able to read that. He created the, the idea, the, the, the image of Africa that we know we were able to relate with our own stories. It doesn't get better than that. So when, when that was stopped, the resurrection of African um, writer series that we are trying to do now, we are trying to bring that back. We are trying to celebrate Africa. We are trying to um, tell our own stories. We are trying to... It forms part of our identity. So it's, what is ours, we need to be able to tell our own stories in the way that we understand it, in the way that we know, than allowing people to just come in and, and then um, try to create a story for us or try to stereotype us or put us in a type of box. So, so the African Writers Series is, is really important. It's really, it's resurrection, is, it is timely and it should always continue. It's something that should always, it should never be stopped. Some of the authors that spoke to me directly were, I think I'll mention just about four. One of them is Cyprian Quincy. I think he's the most prolific author from Africa. I, I mean, he, he was different. He was unique. He told the story in a, a, he had a voice that was unique to him, you know. And I liked some of his books, especially the ones that we'd read in school. African Night Entertainment, uh, Jaguar Nana, uh, The Drummer Boy. Uh, the, uh, the passport of Malem Ilya. And the one I loved the most was actually Iska. I mean, I'm not sure I've met a lot of people that read Iska, but I loved it. I read Things Fall Apart, so I've been, I read so many titles. I read titles by Ngugi, Bessie Head, Amata Edu, Bucheme Cheta, Wole Shoenka, so many of our, of our uh, writers from Nigeria and other parts of Africa actually published in the series. So African Writers Series is, I think um, they are trying to resuscitate it now, but be, uh, between 1962 and 2003, when it was uh, the first uh, series, you know, it, it, the books were being published, it was a household name for writers, uh, for literature and culture um, People, people who are in literature and in culture because they brought out books regularly by African writers and we all read these titles and the titles were also read 
in other parts of the world. James Curry was once described by Emmanuel Ngara as the godfather of African literature and later the epithet was taken up by many others. But we choose to call him a proleptic groundbreaker because James Curry is a man whose prescient doggedness augmented the catalysis of kaleidoscopic voices which reconstructed the cognitive, pedagogic and cultural paradigm of a then beleaguered African continent only just emerging from a colonial world. What would you say to James as he's done in 85? Uh, I would say that he can he can at least relax a bit. I know he, he tends to cycle around Oxford, which uh, absolutely <laughs> impresses me no end. Um, but uh, I, I would say to him that, uh, you know, for him to be here while he's passing the torch, uh, that, that just r really means a lot. Um, he's, he's able to have input, um, which is, you know, invaluable. You know, I mean, how often do you get to have somebody of his caliber involved in what we are getting going? And, and uh, to, to have him wanting to be involved, wanting to attend events, uh, wanting, wanting to participate is, you know, it's, it's, it's absolutely uh, a fantastic experience. So, you know, I, I can tell him to, you know, take it easy, but he's not going to. <laughs> I really uh, wish for James, long life, good health. Um, he has lived such a long and good life to be able to see and recognize um, how much he is appreciated, how his long legacy of contribution to African writing, African fiction, um, African history in many ways is appreciated by younger generations, both in the West, of course, but more importantly, on the continent itself. I just want to thank um, James Corey. I hope he gets to see this video, to thank him for what he has been to African studies and African literature. You know, in the events that you've organized and we've uh, held this year, it's been a delight to see James uh, almost surprised uh, by the amount of love uh, and affection and respect in which he's held. And obviously I hope that James um, is able to continue to see uh, initiatives carried out um, with his permission, but in his name, um, that continue his legacy um, while he remains in good health with us. The way people are celebrated actually uh, is now different from the way it used to be. But I think James Curry deserves much more than just seminars and conferences in honor of him or even societies or professoral chairs being named after him. He deserves to have monuments named after him. I mean, he has done so much work and deserves all the accolades you could get.